Melton, Paul, Palermo, Festerson, Gray, Harding, Mr. President. For remarks by Council Member Brinker Harding. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll be real brief. I uh, just want to uh, hope everyone had a great holiday season. Um, welcome to 2020. Uh, we had a couple weeks off, so if we make a few mistakes or seem a little rusty, I, I know you'll grant us a little uh, forgiveness on that. But uh, it's 2020, and we're ready to get to work for the citizens of Omaha, and look forward to doing business with you. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Omaha City Council. We thank you for joining us here today. As a courtesy to those in attendance and to facilitate the conduct of the people's business, we ask that you turn off or silence all electronic devices at this time. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Item 6, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Antler View East, Replat 1, located southwest of West Maple Road and Big Elk Parkway. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 6 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Item 7, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for estates at Loveland with a waiver of Section 5382B, cul-de-sac length, located southeast of 87th and Pacific Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. B is communication and support. The public hearing on Item 7 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Yes, Mr. President, members of the Council, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the developer and the applicant. Uh, I've got some exhibits to share here. enough can you guys see that okay I guess you can uh, so this is uh, located at the southeast corner of 85th and Pacific Street uh, currently is about seven platted lots um, it's uh, currently zoned R2 it has some existing houses that you'll see here uh, I'll show you the uh, proposed site plan of what uh, is being contemplated it is 18 Sing single family residential houses that will be uh, proposed here at this location with an R4 zoning. There's a private outlot for the street that will serve the various lots. Uh, also, as far as um, along Pacific Street, there's some additional dedicated right of way. I don't know if you've been by this area, but right now the sidewalk is very, very close to Pacific Street. In fact, I don't think there's any green space whatsoever, and it's actually dangerous, I think, for pedestrians. This will improve that. You'll notice there'll be um, additional dedicated right-of-way that will provide for a curve and green space, and then, of course, a sidewalk. And then we have a fence and then landscaping. Also, if you go back to this particular exhibit here, I think we're eliminating about six driveways on Pacific Street, so Pacific Street will become a lot safer as well because you won't have as many uh, contact points with uh, the single-family residential driveways that are making that connection. Uh, as far as what's being proposed on the uh, north side of the development here, uh, that is going to be the villa concept, and on the south side here is more of a single-family residential concept. These are some proposed elevations. As you can see, they're uh, very nice. The houses will probably range between uh, probably $850,000 each to a million plus in this particular area, so it'll be a very nice addition. Here's a, another uh, example of an elevation on the single family side. That's the houses on the, the south side of the development. Um, we did have a neighborhood meeting. We did meet with um, a number of neighbors. I think everyone generally liked what we were doing here. I think. Uh, the houses that are here now are in kind of a state of disrepair, so I think this is in need of um, a redevelopment here. 
not TIF redevelopment, but redevelopment and infill site. Uh, Jeff Elliott is here. This is his brother's house, Chris Elliott, and um, he's interested in making sure that we have some nice screening that will buffer his um, lot from the uh, proposed development, and we've agreed to work with him between now and the um, final plat that comes before you and hopefully come up with some reasonable solution as far as a landscape buffer uh, along the uh, three lots that are being proposed. Right here, this is uh, Mr. Elliott's lot, and then we have three lots that will be immediately adjacent to the north. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if Jeff wants any, to add anything um, to that discussion, but um, here for questions and seek your approval. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents or neutrals? Mr. Elliott. Jeff Elliott, 17007 Marcy Street, here to represent my brother Chris. He apologizes he cannot be here today. Um, he had other commitments. But uh, as Larry said, so here's Pacific Street uh, to the north. I think I switched it around on you, but uh, 87th Street, their project is here along Pacific Street. Jeff, if you could pull the mic over. Yes. Um, my brother's lot is right here. As you can see today, he has another lot that's directly to the north of him that runs longitudinally or right next to it with one home that faces 87th Street. Um, the way it looks today, here's his lot. As you can see, there's many trees, shrubs. His view to the north towards Pacific Street, towards the project today is heavily landscaped um, and he cannot see Pacific Street. As Larry mentioned, uh, his lot is here. Today there's one single family home here that faces 87th Street. After the project is, is complete, there'll be three homes that face directly towards his lot. So he had early uh, conversations with Bill Dyer, who is uh, the person assembling all these properties. Bill had assured him that there would be a landscape screen. And so I'm here today just asking to make sure that that happens on behalf of my brother. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? The public hearing is closed. Councilmember Harding, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly state, I, I went to the neighborhood meeting that was referenced uh, earlier, and, and I think uh, to a person that was there, uh, was very supportive of, of the efforts of the developer. And I think the developer, the developers uh, need to be, um, uh, I guess, congratulated for, for the process that they went through and, and professionally uh, represented what was going to happen there. This is a great, uh, it's interesting, we're talking about 85th and Pacific it being an infill project, but that's exactly what this is. And I think it'll be, um, it'll be a, a great addition to the neighborhood. Uh, I think it'll be a great addition to the city of Omaha, as well as uh, District 66. Thank you, Council Member Harding. And, and District 3, believe it or not, it goes that far west, just on the north side of Pacific, and uh, we share this boundary. Um, and there's great excitement on my side of Pacific Street about the project, too, um, particularly as you talk to the merchants in the Countryside Village area. They're, they're excited to have new people who can walk um, to their businesses and, and patronize their, their stores. So um, that was encouraging to hear as well. Council Member Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I, I agree with those comments. I, I just wonder, though, if, uh, Larry, you want to address the um, landscaping concern that was presented and how that will be handled going forward? Sure. Um, you'll notice um, we do have some tree mitigation requirements on the site already. And so uh, this particular site plan shows the um, landscaping that will be uh, expected to be uh, planted uh, throughout the area. We're also trying to preserve as many healthy, good trees and species of trees as we can uh, throughout the site. Uh, it, one thing I wanted to point out is uh, Bill Dyer, who is one of the developers, he actually lives right here. So he has a significant interest in, 
in making sure that this uh, area is nicely buffered. I would also point out that um, the buffering, I, think, I believe there's a 25 foot required rear setback on the south side of these particular lots. We're actually um, going above and beyond that. It's really about 35 to 50 feet that will be between the lot line and the actual back of the uh, houses on the south side. So we think this will be a, a first class development and I think we can work with Mr. Elliott to make sure that we've addressed his concerns regarding landscaping. Okay. And, and Mr. Elliott, were, were you suggest you just want to see what's on the diagram actually happen or, or are you suggesting something in addition to what's been discussed so far? I think we'd like to have something in addition to what's shown. Um, uh, we were able to look at the that drawing uh, for the first time yesterday. I think it's just a representation of what plantings could go there. I guess we'd like to have some time to work with a developer to um, come up with a plan that works for both okay. us and, and them. And it sounds like they're willing to do that. And I, today is just preliminary plat, but I just wanted to make sure that um, I understood uh, the point you're making and that you're in conversation about it. Great, okay. thank you. Thanks. And, and I would just add, there's a recent project on 90th where there was concern from a neighbor too and there was a commitment from um, Jason Thielen to, to work out something with the neighbor and that was done in that case so I have no reason to believe why that won't happen here so. Mr. Hardy yeah one other thing I was, I was going to bring it up too Mr. Fesserson said it, this is preliminary plat and we can certainly take care of that before maybe final uh, one other thing I failed to mention that the developers are doing on this project, which I think is is uh, somewhat remarkable, is that they're working with, uh, with uh, I think, Restore to um, donate or have um, either if there are appliances or windows or things of that nature be uh, recycled and, and reutilized uh, rather than just demolishing those, which I, I think, again, is something that shows the... Uh, the commitment of the, the developer to not only the what the project will be, but what's there currently can be reused. Thank you. Is there a motion? Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item seven is approved seven to zero. Items 8 to 10 relate to the same project and can be considered together for Spruce 180 Replat 1, located southeast of 181st and Spencer Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 8, an ordinance to rezone this property from AG District and R4 District to R4 District. Item 9, a resolution to approve the final plat for Spruce 180 Replat 1. Item 10, a resolution to approve the Spruce 180 Replat 1 subdivision agreement. The public hearing on items 8 through 10 begins at this time. Is there a proponent? Thank you, Mr. President, members of council, Brent Beller. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, with me today is Jeff Elliott, project engineer. He's on my side on this deal. Uh, this final plat is in conformance with the preliminary plat that was before you. Uh, we're here for any questions. Appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Items 8 through 10 are approved 7 to 0. Items 11 and 12 can be considered together for property located northwest of 144th and F Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 11, an ordinance to rezone this property from GI District to MU District. Item 12, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to a mixed use district development agreement for Alltech Business Park. The public hearing on items 11 and 12 begin at this time. Are there any proponents? Uh, my name is Kyle Hazy with ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, representing the applicant. Um, the portion of this uh, Alltech Business Park is there was a lot nine, as shown in this uh, exhibit here in the corner. Uh, we are looking to add that alt nine um, to the rest of the uh, development and as part of the agreement. And uh, we're open to uh, any questions that you might have about this project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Uh, Council Member Pauls. So I was reading uh, through the uh, uh, results of uh, the changes you want to have made. It's something uh, about a uh, traffic study. 
it, was it conclusive or in, I, I, I didn't quite understand. Uh, I believe the, the city did have a chance to review the, the full traffic study. In the initial report, uh, they had re uh, received it, but not had a chance to re fully review it before the report was written. Um, since then, I believe uh, they have reviewed it. Um, they're okay with, um, or they, they're in agreement with what was uh, in conclusion or brought up within the uh, report, and that um, they're comfortable with the, the one story the one story um, requirement as a max um, to be removed from the agreement. Okay, so in other words, it's buildings uh, more than one story, is that what I'm told? Yes, yeah, pri prior to um, the agreement stated there could only be uh, one story buildings allowed within the development uh, based on the 2004 traffic study. Uh, the, 2000, the most recent uh, traffic study uh, came to the conclusion that um, the way that the development has been built out to this date, um, that buildings that were greater than one story uh, could be built on the site and still meet the, the parking requirements okay. and not the increased traffic. Okay, well, what piqued my interest is a study was done in 2004 and they were concerned about the traffic pattern. Since then, uh, the, that area has they have many more buildings, but the traffic is not an issue now. Correct. Because I think in the, uh, the initial result, or the initial traffic study, there was uh, more office and higher uh, traffic generating uses prescribed in that area. Okay. Uh, since it's been built out, those uses were not actually applied. Okay. 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 Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. 11 and 12 are approved, 7 to 0. Item 13, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the ACI 3 overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located at 11540 West Dodge Road. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. The public hearing on item 13 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 13 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 14, a resolution to approve the Laird Street Habitat 6 tax increment financing redevelopment project plan located between 16th and 23rd Streets and Sailor and Pratt Streets in an amount up to $269,500. The public hearing on item 14 <coughs> begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning. Uh, we begin uh, with a uh, TIF project from Habitat for Humanity. They've done a number of projects in North Omaha. Previously, this was a proposal for 12 single-family homes up around the Laird and 18th Street area. A little bit better view of the lots. They have a few different models of homes. That this, or actually, let's do this one. Give you a bit of a flavor for what they build. Uh, 12 new single-family homes on vacant sites. Total project cost is $2.6 million. Approximately, they're requesting $269,500 in TIF support. Um, this uh, project is consistent with all our guidelines and requirements. We ask for your approval. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. I'm basically opposed to TIF in general. And the reason is, I'm now in a blighted area, I guess, somewhere between 72nd, the interstate, and way south to Harrison. So I guess that means that they could put up a shoebox apartment building on my block. I'm opposed to that. I hear their neighborhood association might be opposed to the similar type thing in the Dundee area. There was an article in the uh, Sunday paper that mentioned what has, I think, been denied before, that uh, the developer could apply for a property tax break known as tax increment financing. 
I recently got a $700 a year increase in my property tax in a blighted area, a severely blighted area. Now, as I understand the property tax break, the developer can buy and develop this property and pay the current property tax or nothing for 20 years, and now they want to boost it to 25. But as property owners in those areas, of course, pay higher property values and higher property taxes because of it. We don't get the break. So I guess we just need to vacate and let the younger people move in from wherever. But if they want to live in apartments, they can pick up and leave pretty easily, can't they? What happens when everybody that can't afford their property taxes in our residence moves out of the city? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Luis Jimenez, 3306 Birch Street. Hello, council members. Um, I would generally be opposed to this, but I actually think this is a good idea to use the TIF on this project. Um, I So I'm just going to oppose it one way and explain that um, the language used for blighted areas is confused, I think, by the legislator and residents. A blighted area is um, something to do with people that spend more most of their time in the area, in my opinion. So how are those people and residents benefiting from projects? That is uh, a source of my opposition. I don't see that happening with TIF, but I think this TIF project um, is, is a good uh, model. But thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? The public hearing is closed. I would just note for the record that the tax increment property taxes are paid based upon the base value determined at the year of acquisition for the project by the assessor's office. And it's at that value over a 15-year period that the taxes are paid, after which the incremental increase in property taxes is added to that. Is there motion approved? Second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 14 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 15, an application to consider a Class C liquor license for Old Fashioned Garden Cafe located at 11040 Oak Street. The public hearing on item 15 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? No. Name and address for the record. Uh, Fred Hensley, uh, at address is 7006 um, South 139th Avenue, Omaha, 68138. Okay. Um, for the Old Fashioned Garden Cafe. And you're here happy to answer any questions? Yes, I am. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 15 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 16, an application to consider a Class CK liquor license for Omaha Dog Bar located at 1231 South, or South 14th Street, A's communication from the Planning Department regarding a certificate of occupancy. The public hearing on item 16 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the Council, Happy New Year. Mike Kelly, 2804 South uh, uh, 87th Avenue. I'm here with uh, Leah Thrasher and Peter Andredean, who are opening the new uh, dog bar and I hope to with your blessing. Um, I will let her explain the operation. Uh, so there's, and there, there's already some misnomers. There's not going to be any barbed wire or anything like that there. They, they just took over the property about three days ago. So they have a lot of work to do, a lot of permitting to do with planning and so on and so forth, which they intend to do. So anything you do here today would be conditioned, we understand, on, on all of those things. But I would turn it over to Leo just briefly if you have questions. Thank you, Lee. If you could approach the mic, tell us your name and address, and then your comments. Yes. Hi, I'm Leah Thrasher, uh, 1519 South 49th Street. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Did you want to say anything, sir? 
Uh, Peter Anaradian, 12205 Ersk <coughs> Erskine Circle. Okay. And um, Leah, did you want to explain the concept? Sure. I, I definitely can. Sorry, I'm very tall. Um, uh, it's a membership based dog park bar and eatery. It'll pick you up. You oh, well, okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So yes, it's a membership-based dog park barn and, and restaurant. Um, we've been doing pop-ups for about two years, uh, working with existing liquor license holders, um, doing SDL permits, and uh, kind of popping up around Midtown, downtown. And so we're just really excited to have a permanent home. Exciting. Uh, and, the, and the dog's a member. Yes, so the memberships are per dog. Um, any human is welcome, even if you, have, if you don't have a dog. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. I could are there talking about it for... Great. Well, other council members may have questions, but we'll, we'll call for other proponents to speak at this time, if there are any. Now we'll call for opponents. We'll close the public hearing, and I don't hear anyone barking, so <laughs> is there a motion? Motion. Second. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Contingent upon uh, the permits you take. Is that the same with the second? Okay. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Paul. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 16 is approved, 7 to 0. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Thank you. Item 17, an application to consider a Class I liquor license for Top Golf Omaha, located at 908 North 102nd Street. The public hearing be, uh, begins at this time on item 17. Are there any proponents? Uh, good afternoon. Rob Futhi, 500 Energy Plaza, on behalf of the applicant Top Golf. I have with me uh, our Director of Operations, Marcus Parent, as well. Happy to answer any questions. Just real quickly, in case you're not familiar with Top Golf, I always say it's like a bowling alley mixed with a driving range, mixed with a full course or uh, full service restaurant as well. Um, this will be the approximately 60th location that Top Golf is open across the country, and I think we're very excited to be here in Omaha. Great, thank you. Oh, uh, I think we're looking at end of April, early oh, I'm May. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so we have... Uh, you have to tell us your name oh, and perfect. address. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Marcus Parent, 3601 Jones Street. Um, our opening date, we're, uh, we'll do a soft open on March 22nd and a hard open on March 27th. Great. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Council Member Festerson, did you want to... So this is his district, so I assume he'll be the on the first tee and the first foursome. Absolutely. All right. You are very much welcome. I've been told there's 72 bays. 72 bays. Yes, sir. So there's room for all of us. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, you better bring your safety gear if we show up. So. All right. Uh, are there any? Did we have the close the public hearing? Is there anyone else wishes to be heard? Proponent or opponent? Public hearing is closed. We need a motion and a second. We have a motion. And a second. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 17 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 18, an application to consider a Class B liquor license for El Mexicano 6, located at 4922 South 24th Street. The public hearing on item 18 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Um, just looking around the room with our liquor rule, the person's supposed to be here. You were notified. Oh, you're here. Okay, so come on down. And identify yourself. And hey, from the Pino, 4922 South 24th Street, Omaha. Thank you. Did you get his name? Would you repeat your name, please? Ephraim hey, Patino. Thank you. Um, are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Second. Roll call. Melton. Yeah. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 18 is Thank approved, 7 to 0. Good luck. Thank you. Item 19, an application to consider a Class L liquor license for Patriot Homebrew Supply, located at 2929 North 204th Street, Suite 107. The public hearing on item 19 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Me. Um, Jennifer Misfeld, 14826 Spalding Street, 68116, and I'm actually the owner and the manager of Patriot Homebrew Supply. Are there any other proponents? 
Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Thank you. Second. I was looking for a place the other day for some yeast for my effervescent I just brewed, but I didn't, you weren't open yet, so I had to. What day was that, Monday? No. Yeah, it was Monday. I'm always closed on Mondays. Okay. I, I tell all my customers I deserve one day off. I'm there six days a week. All right. Thank you. I'll see you next time. I'll all right. On a Tuesday. <laughs> Roll call. Melton. Yes. Paul. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 19 is approved 7 to 0. Item 20 to consider an addition application for Goldie's Class C liquor license located at 5502 North 103rd Street to add an irregular shaped area approximately 26 feet by 60 feet to the north. The public hearing on item 20 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Yes. yes. I'm Cindy Kukuski, 1510 South 93rd Street, Omaha, 68124. Owner. Chad Dargy, uh, 3309 South 88th Street. Omaha 68124. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Item 20 is approved 7 to 0. Consent agenda. Any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed, unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. The item 27, I believe, was removed from consent. The public hearings on these items were held December 17. Is there a motion on 21 through 26 and 28? through 29. Roll call. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Is there a motion on item 27? Second. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 6 to 1. The public hearings on agenda items 30 through 55 are today. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate which of these agenda items you are speaking on, identify yourself by your name, address, who you represent, if you are a proponent or opponent. Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Melton. Pauls, yes. Palermo, yes. Festerson, yes. Gray, yes. Harding, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. One public hearing will be held for items 56 and 57. Item 56, an ordinance to amend Omaha Municipal Code, sections 48-111 through 48-119 to adopt the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. Item 57, an ordinance to amend Omaha Municipal Code, section 43-121 to adopt the 2018 International Residential Code. The public hearing on items 56 and 57 begin at this time. Are there any proponents? Anna Bespoyazny, Superintendent of Permits and Inspections, 1819 Farnham Street. Good afternoon, President Jerem and members of the council. As part of the city's effort to update the building codes, the planning department proposes to adopt the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. Currently, we enforce the 2006 edition. There is one new amendment which notes the height of the weeds in section 302.4. It fills in the blank for the height of the weeds. Previously adopted amendments remain. Most sections are similar, if not exact duplicates of the 2006 edition with the following exceptions. Section 306, component serviceability, which basically says to maintain components and equipment in safe working order. Section 604, Electrical Facilities. This section expands upon electrical hazards, water exposure, and wiring of electrical equipment. Chapter 7, Fire Safety Requirements, comprises the most changes. It reflects similar language for fire ratings, fire walls, and fire protection systems as that found in the International Building Code. It also reflects the requirement for carbon monoxide detectors that the state of Nebraska currently requires. I have um, I'm available for any 
questions with regards to the property maintenance code. Thank you. Are there any other proponents who wish to be heard? Are there any opponents who wish to be heard? Oh, you're a proponent? I'm a proponent, and I'll okay. go faster next time. That's uh, okay. Jerry Stanford, 14711 Industrial Road. Uh, with regard to the property maintenance code, I am a landlord, and I currently sit on the uh, property maintenance board. I've been there since its inception. Thank I'd you for your service. Thank you. And I would encourage you to adopt this as amended. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? These are people in favor. All right, now we'll get to the opponents. Are there any, anyone here who wishes to testify in opposition to this? David Holtzclaw, 5005 Chicago Street. Welcome, you may begin. Thank you, uh, thank you for letting me talk. I'm a mechanical engineer and licensed in the state of Nebraska. We specialize in building science, building forensics. We've done testing on a, over a thousand residential properties and several hundred commercial properties. About half of those are in greater Omaha. Um, and we have several issues with the uh, item 57, the IRC changes. Um, I have handouts if you want them. If you have a handout that you want council members to receive, please hand them to the city clerk and they'll, they'll distribute them. And they'll make it a part of the record. Thank you. Uh, first of all, in the, in the ordinance, particularly dealing with Chapter 11 of the IRC, there are several um, errors. Uh, for example, they reference the wrong sections. Uh, the, there are some mandatory requirements for energy efficiency in, in new construction buildings. Uh, and what is in the ordinance does not line up with the correct sections of the 2018 IRC. Uh, secondly, is that one of the new energy efficiency measures in the um, uh, well, it's not, it actually was added in 2018 code, but it's new, or 20, 2012 code, but it's just now, we've skipped two code revisions and went up to 2018, uh, and that's called a blower door test. And that's the only way to measure the air tightness of a house. By eliminating this test, uh, you're going to cost the homeowner uh, about $91 a year uh, in energy lost, and that's based on a, uh, a Nebraska Energy Office study. Uh, and that's also going to add about uh, 968 pounds of CO2 emissions per year per household. So quite a lot. Uh, this is also going to decrease uh, indoor air quality. You're going to have a lot of pollutants uh, coming in and moisture coming in and moisture moving through the exterior walls, which uh, there's about 800 peer-reviewed studies showing that will lead to mold damage. I've given you in the handout a couple of references. Uh, those are four out of 800. So. Um, we think not having a door blower test is a huge mistake. There's plenty of uh, peer-reviewed science to support this, uh, which I can give to anybody that requests for it. The so cost what, what, for such a test... Mr. Sir, Mr. Hoskell, what is this door blower test? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so part of the code since 2012 is that all new residential buildings need to have uh, what's called a blower door test to test how leaky a building is, a residential building is, and there are numbers to hit. So uh, in 2009, that was seven air exchanges. 2012, that was five. This new one, which is, which is adopted by the state and now the city of Omaha, is three. So it's gotten tighter over the last decade. And the door blower is the only way to measure that. So there's no way you can look at a house and know how leaky it is. You have to measure it. Okay. You may continue, unless that was concluding. That, that's, uh, that's as far as I wanted to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents who wish oh, to be oh, heard? Uh, no, I thought you, I thought, I thought you were just talking about the door blower test. Oh, okay. No, there, there are other issues, too. Okay. Um, the second issue is they um, allow uh, duct ca um, uh, interior wall cavities for duct returns. That's also going to uh, depressurize a house, cause more air leakage and more poor indoor air quality. Um, and I've given you some references on those. It also uh, removes what's called the ERI, or Energy Rating Index Pathway. I think this was actually done by accident, uh, just in terms of the sections that were amended out didn't match up. So I think that might have been done by accident because the wrong section got eliminated, or maybe it was meant to be. Um, so that actually allows a builder more freedom and, and more options. So what happens is instead of having eaten a certain door blower number, you can maybe be a little higher if you add more insulation or better mechanical equipment. So allow some freedom from the builder to 
play different games to meet the overall uh, efficiency of the, of the building. Thank you. Um, now, just because I see Mr. Standard for sitting on the edge of your seat, let me explain the process to everyone. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are interested in this. The way the public hearing will work is I will continue hearing opponents. Then I will give Ms. Best Boyazny a rebuttal opportunity. And then um, for you, Mr. Standerford, someone would have to call on you to, to, for your further comments. I, I will call on you if, if someone else doesn't beat me to it. Oh, you were going to do on both of those. Okay, well, I'll give you a chance. Okay. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Hausclaw. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Good afternoon. My name is Scott Williams, 1139 South 93rd Avenue. Um, as uh, brought in front of the council today, I am an uh, opponent of the adoption of, uh, of the uh, of the code, the 2018 code, into our municipal codes, uh, specifically because of the amendments that have been created to the code. Um, I would encourage the council to seek a recommendation on how to adopt the 2018 code into our municipal codes as unamended. Um, I do echo what Mr. Holtzclaw had said about the amendments uh, rolling back the potential for opportunities for improvement in our community. Um, as a, a nearly aged out young professional in our community, um, one of the things I've addressed this council about in the past is what type of community it is that people want to see and people want to live in. Sustainability, in particular, is important to me. Uh, colleagues, friends, neighbors of mine as well. It's one of the reasons why I came to address you today. Um, and the updating of our municipal codes to meet higher standards is the type of action that we can take to continue to improve the sustainability of our community and of our city. And by amending the code to allow for lower standards, we are um, avoiding, we are missing potential opportunities for improvement. Um, I do happen to have in the past worked with home energy evaluators like Mr. Holtzclaw um, and others to, uh, to, to conduct blower door tests. And um, if, it, if you're interested in the description of the way that works, I'd be yeah, happy I'd, to. I'd, I'd like you to tell me how that oh, works. Oh, sure. Um, so if you envision um, a building uh, uh, an energy rater would describe the building envelope, the, the, the part that d divides the inside from the outside. Right? We condition space inside of the building so that during the summer we can cool the building, during the winter we can warm the building, and we're trying to divide the building from the environment. When it's 12 degrees outside, you don't want it to be 12 degrees inside, and so the building envelope is that barrier. Um, and there are different ways that temperature and humidity can move in and out of the building. Um, directly through the walls, through the windows, through the frames of the windows, or through air gaps that exist within the building. Um, uh, between the foundation and the sill of the, of, the, of the house, for example, around a window, through rafters, or through the, through the roof. And one key component of building a sustainable and energy efficient home is to uh, limit the amount of air loss, air leakage. If you have 72 degree air, leaking outside, then you are either losing the cooling that you've put into the building or the heating that you've put into the building because it is either warmer or colder outside. So uh, that's what a blower door test is looking to study. It's looking to pressurize and depressurize the home, uh, the building, and then look for leaks or gaps around the building. And by doing that test, there are relatively um, easy and highly cost-effective methods for improving the efficiency, the home energy performance of the building. Um, you can seal cracks and gaps when you can identify them with tools, including a blower door test. Um, there are, as, as Mr. Holtzclaw described, there are um, efficiency metrics that can be met for a home. How good is the home um, in achieving energy efficiency? And so the blower door test is the most effective and fundamentally the only real way to tell, is this home meeting energy efficiency guidelines as set out by the code. And by amending the adaptation uh, of this code and removing that requirement, we are lowering the threshold and lowering the ability for, uh, for consumers, for home buyers to be able to, to know that the energy performance of the home uh, is meeting high standards. Thank you. Does that describe technically what it is? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my concern is that, as I said, we are lowering the opportunities for improvements in our community and to the residents, to the homeowners of our community. And so I would recommend, if at all possible, 
that the council work with planning to see that the adaptation of the code to our municipal code be as unamended. Because again, the amendments are rolling back potential opportunities for improvements. And I think that um, while we have, uh, we have good opportunities for improvements as suggested, there are more opportunities well within our reach if we do not allow amendments to, to stifle those, those steps forward. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any other opponents? And if there are more, you can kind of come closer to the front so that you're ready to go. David Corbin, uh, 1002 North 49th Street, Chair of the Nebraska Sierra Club. Uh, I oppose the amendments. Uh, the IRC was originated, but first of all, it's kind of telling that it's taking this long and because the state passed something that the, the city is now just now changing old codes to two now a year old and going into 2020. And those codes uh, were put forward. Uh, the, my expertise is public health. And one of, one of the things they say is safety, health, and welfare. To best meet the safety, these people worked on these uh, codes for many, many, many years. And it's called the international because many people came together who were experts. It seems strange to me that somehow in a short amount of time since the state passed the law that, that the city can amend those things that have been worked on for so many years by so many experts. I find that uh, hard to believe. I also would urge the city to work more closely with OPPD, who just passed uh, uh, net zero carbon by 2050. If you do not adopt the code as it was, then it will be next to impossible for OPPD to meet those standards. One of the things that OPPD is saying is that the city is growing. As the city grows, there's going to be more houses. As there's more houses, then that means that OPPD has to create more ways to produce energy. If you make it efficient, and if you make it so that we're not uh, creating more carbon in terms of uh, climate change, then what uh, uh, Mr. Williams talked about, Dr. Williams talked about, is that uh, young people are wanting to move to a place that is sustainable. OPPD is making that commitment. I hope you will join them in making that commitment and let the standards uh, stay as they are written by the International Standards Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corbin. Are there any other opponents? Provide your name and address and then your comments. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Leon Komar. I live 5712 Reese Street here in Omaha in Mr. Jaron's district. And I sent him a letter uh, last week. And sorry if I seem a little rushed. I didn't know that this uh, be this early in the meeting, and I just got here. Uh, I'm a HERS energy rater and have been so for the last uh, 12 years, and so I'm fairly fluent in codes, and I also do blower door duct testing for code uh, compliance here and in the state of Iowa. So uh, <clears throat> prior to that, I worked uh, for over 25 years as a housing rehab inspector with the city of Omaha and uh, have deep respect for the building codes and in equal enforcement. And now it might seem that I come here with a self-interest in trying to promote more work for myself. That's not the case. I come here as a citizen and as one who has knowledge of the impact of these changes. And I'm concerned for the safety and well-being <coughs> of our citizens. Um, Sorry, I, I don't want to keep you folks up. I don't want to put you under any more pressure, but you, you've kind of gone through half your time. So Yeah, oh, I didn't know it was time. Yeah. Anyhow, this is a page, of, a copy of the front page of the IRC that the, is uh, being uh, discussed, and it's a 900-some page document. This is uh, the front page of the 35 pages of amendments to that. I feel uh, qualified, perhaps, on the energy side. Uh, but I want to point out that right now we are under the 2009 Energy Code, and uh, 
the 2018 code I mean, was adopted by the state of Nebraska and was to be implemented later this year. The 2019 uh, uh, IRC incorporates as Chapter 11 that that ordinance. Uh, it, however, the uh, <coughs> I mean that uh, the ordinance as written is kind of confusing. First of all, it states that it, it, uh, it in, a, in a, adopting the 2018 IRC, it also wants to adopt the 2009 IC. <laughs> It, it, it adopts the, uh, in, in adopting the 2019 IRC, it also incorporates uh, the 2009 uh, uh, IECC, which has already been uh, approved in, in, in force. But and near the end of the uh, uh, document, it says it refers to adopting sections of the 2006 IECC. This is confusing. It's a jumbled up. Uh, references, which make, if this is in fact what they intend, it's going to be confusing to all all parties who have to enforce it and, and oblige by it. Uh, and I suspect that the reference to the 2006 might be a typo, like a document that was presented for rewrite and it was either not deleted or revised properly. But the main concern I have is one of the revisions in the uh, code is uh, to allow building cavities used for uh, return air uh, uh, ducting. As a uh, tester, I find it very problematic and that building cavities are very leaky. These, this is a practice that was used back in the early 1900s and you want to keep it going today? I don't know, there must be some outside influence that wants to keep this practice going. I find it very leaky and one in unintended, and in testing it, I find these systems are very, uh, do not meet the current code. And there, in the current code, there's an option for a second test. Uh, I'm gonna need some, you to wrap up. Okay, anyhow, the short of it is, um, the limits for the new code or extremely low, and if uh, built, if the building cavities are continued to, to be used, it's going to be uh, an uh, 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 unintended consequence that built HVAC contractors will not be able to meet the code. What are you going to do about that? There may be uh, an alternate, and I'd be willing to uh, talk with the planning department and trying to work out what can be done. But I also wanted to submit some information. It's, I, I submitted some paperwork. There's a two-sided two uh, report there. Uh, an associate of mine found a uh, Don Trout, did some testing on a house where uh, a, a, one of the kids had severe migraine headaches. And it was later determined that, determined that it was caused by uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. He found that the reason was, was several of the bays, uh, joist bays in the basement, were not sealed off. That sometimes happens. People walk by it quite often, and, and you don't even know what you're looking at. All right. Well, we'll make those a okay. part of the record. All right. Well, short of it is, um, technicians have had, very, various technicians have been through the house and never noticed it, but because he's a, a trained testing uh, uh, tester, he found it. The, I bring this up because that was in November of last year, and in the following month, I found a similar situation in a new house under construction. The only way I was able to, to uh, discover it is because it required testing of the attic ductwork. This problem was in the basement. So it's there in my notes. And if Thank you. Gotta, you. All right. Are there any other opponents? I'm Mark Loskatoff. Um, my company is Omaha Home Energy Analysis and Testing. And for the last 10 years, I've been testing homes uh, partly for um, 
compliance with the codes in Iowa and Nebraska. What is the address, sir? 6323 North 115th Circle. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm not very well prepared because I just came from a job which lasted longer than I expected. Um, but in, in my experience, about t uh, 10 to 20% of the um, jobs that I test for um, compliance with the codes in Omaha and in Iowa um, fail. Uh, which tells me that um, it's a good thing that we're testing them uh, because if you don't test, you don't know what you've got. Uh, as far as air leakage testing, um, that's been the case in Iowa. In Nebraska, uh, air leakage is not currently tested. I think it should be. Um, the 2018 code does require that. The national code does. Um, I think that would be a good thing to do here in Nebraska. Uh, if, if that is amended out, uh, as I think it is in the ordinance that's been presented, um, that would not be a good thing because we would not know what we have in terms of leakage. Uh, it also pertains to ventilation, uh, air quality in the houses. Um, as Leon pointed out, it refers to the 2006 IECC. I don't know where that comes from. It doesn't seem to belong in there. Um, so it, it is confusing. I think it's probably disorganized and uh, needs to be rewritten. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Larry Store, <clears throat> 5015 Lafayette Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. Omaha, 68132. It is extremely confusing. A couple of years back, I had to have a roofing job done, as with quite a few neighbors on my street. So I decided to read the IRC and maybe get involved with making sure the contractors that were hired were licensed and knew what they were doing and that the citizen knew what they had to do which involved, of course, taking pictures of the damage, talking with the inspectors, uh, taking pictures of the work before and after, having them available for the inspector to come back out again and look at them and certify. Well, certify what? They take a quick look and they're gone. But I spent time beforehand also coming down to the city planning and getting explanations on things before the work was done, uh, back down later to try to get explanations as to why the inspector wouldn't answer some questions. Like, I'm sorry, but I, the way I understand it, the ventilation isn't proper. According to building codes and stuff, certain things shouldn't be done. It looks like it wasn't done. The contractor's not going to answer that. The, the city inspector should be able to because he's got to approve it. So how many older homeowners like me over the years uh, haven't updated their house every year or their property every year? And all of a sudden they decide they have to sell or forced to sell and find out that it doesn't meet requirements going back to how many years? So it's a little unfair uh, to not have this clearly explained in the World Herald or whatever, because the way lawyers write these things up, it's, it's uh, impossible. And then when the city doesn't have enough inspectors, you can't take up their time asking silly questions. It's up to the homeowner, if there's something awry, to take it to court, I guess. And that's still lingering for almost two years now. Uh, even with the insurance company's help. So be careful what you do. You know, protect the homeowner, not the contractors, and not the roofing companies, and not the insurance companies. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other opponents? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed.
Are you an op opponent, sir? Okay. Okay, so we'll have Ms. Best Boy Eisney come back for a few minutes of rebuttal. Okay, I'll give you my comments on the IRC now. <laughs> you may want to, um, if you would, please comment on why uh, the amendments were proposed by the department to eliminate the things we heard. I do have some of that in, in here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before the 2019 Nebraska State Legislature passed legislation updating the state building codes to the 2018 editions, the City of Omaha began the process of reviewing the 2018 International Residential Code for adoption. Currently, we enforce the 2006 edition of the International Residential Code. Given that the code cycle is three years, we are four editions behind, so there is a need to move to a more current edition. The planning department formed a code committee of home builders, residential remodeling contractors, engineers, architects, and city representatives to review the proposed code. Meetings began in March of 2019 and continued through July of 2019. <coughs> At each meeting, we covered one chapter of the code book. We went through section by section to determine if it was appropriate for our jurisdiction to adopt and or amend. Some chapters took several meetings to complete, and at some meetings we were able to cover multiple chapters. Our approach was to be mindful that jumping four code editions could be a shock to the local construction industry. According to the International Code Council, since 1998, the cost to build the average home in the United States is about $358,000, an increase of roughly $200,000 while the annual income has lingered around $52,000 for the last several years. Our emphasis while reviewing the code was on life safety and affordability. Some of the highlights of the ordinance are maintaining standard footing sizes for one and two story homes. This makes the review process and the inspection process faster. Engineering is still allowed if the design deviates from the standard sizes. Deck requirements are more extensive in the 2018 edition. For decks, we have also reflected standard footing sizes based on the loading. Braced walls, which add to the rigidity of a structure, are more extensive as well. To address the energy efficiency of single-family homes, we propose adopting Chapter 11 of the 2018 IRC with amendments. Chapter 11 of the IRC is the residential portion of the International Energy Conservation Code. We will review the commercial portion of the Energy Code when we review the 2018 International Building Code this year. We also propose the adoption of the following appendix chapters, which have not previously been adopted in Omaha. Appendix J for existing buildings and structures, which recognizes that existing structures may not meet the standards of today's codes, yet they are still able to be rehabilitated without compromising safety. Appendix Q, tiny houses, addresses the need for affordable housing options. And Appendix S, straw bale construction. This method of construction originated in Nebraska in the late 1800s. And although it is not high in use presently, there is a certain population that is interested in this method of construction and utilizing a standard code would be beneficial. Um, to comment on some of the uh, previous testimony, we not only looked at life safety things, we looked at energy things. But in my mind, I don't disagree that the testing that was discussed earlier is a bad idea. What I disagree with is mandating that every new home owner needs to pay for that testing. I think it's up to the um, homeowners to negotiate with their home builders if they see the value in doing that additional testing and um, have that done at their expense rather than dictating that every new home in the city uh, needs to have that testing. Thank you. Uh, do you know what approximate cost is for the testing? I've heard it ranges anywhere between $300 and $700. Okay. Well, no. No. Hold on, hold on. The way this works is there's no cat calling or shouting from the audience. Um, 
if a council member wishes to call on you to, to get your estimates as to what costs are, they can do that, but we don't conduct the business that way. Um, all right, thank you, Ms. Bespoyaski. At this time, I'm going to close the uh, public hearing. I promised Mr. Standerford I'd call him up to, you had some remarks on the other ordinance, uh, and then we have council members with lights on. Name and address again. Sure. Jerry Standerford, 14711 Industrial Road. Um, President Jerem, uh, members of the council, thanks for calling me back. Uh, I'm a longtime home builder in Omaha. I manage both Sherwood Homes and Lane Building Corporation. I'm here today on behalf of the Eastern Nebraska Development Corporation, as well as both home building uh, groups, the Metropolitan Omaha Builders Association and Build Omaha. In 2000, the city of Omaha moved to adopt the International Residential Code for one and two family dwellings as written by the International Code Council, the ICC. Since the adoption of the 2000 IRC in 2001, I have served with the invitation of the city on every code review committee of the IRC. The directive of the ICC from the beginning has been to review the code and make amendments at the local level. Although there have been many changes to the code in the last 20 years, it has been examined and amended each time, as has the ordinance before you today. The 2018 IRC was adopted as a statewide code in the legislature last session. During the legislative hearings, the testifiers for passage of the update stated plainly that the code could be and should be amended by the local jurisdictions as needed. At the International Code Council, many changes are proposed during each three-year code cycle. Frequently, these changes can be attributed to vendors promoting their products and services to gain an unfair market share over their competitors. Often these changes neither benefit the home buyers nor do they increase health or safety. They do add to the cost of, new, of a new home. Additionally, government agencies promote their political agendas through changes to the code. Combined with a growing shortage of available labor, we see a continual increase in the cost of housing and shelter today in crisis proportions. Often cited in the code arena are the studies purported that new codes will save the owner money and pay them back in a short amount of time, as we maybe have heard today. I would offer to you a study by Eric Levinson of Georgetown University in 2016. Mr. Levinson's in-depth study of strict energy codes implemented in California since 1978 and tightened every few years used three different methods in examining and evaluation, evaluating energy savings. He found that all three approaches yield estimated energy savings significantly short of those projected when the regulations were enacted. On behalf of the home building community, the code review committee, and futures home buyers in the city of Omaha, I would ad ask you to adopt this ordinance as submitted. Thank and I'm you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Festerson, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. So I've, I've been around long enough to know that whenever you start talking about uh, something like the property maintenance code or the residential code, let alone the commercial code or electrical or plumbing codes, um, things can get complicated very quickly, and there's oftentimes um, lots of different opinions about the details within these codes because there are a lot of details in these codes. And that's primarily why we always encourage the department when they um, go through this process, as they should, to engage the industry and others in committee work to make sure the um, thoughts and opinions by the experts are being expressed along the way in these areas because none of us have this direct expertise. Um, and I'll just observe for the record, too, that I think we, we probably shouldn't have combined the public hearings for 56 and 57. That kind of led us off to a confusing start. But I'll, I'll just note that I don't think any, any opponents were opposed to 56, the property maintenance code. The concerns that were on the record now are the opposition to 57, which is the, re the changes to the international residential code. So that's what I want to focus on uh, right now. So I mentioned committees, and I know there was a committee that, Anna, you worked with on this. Can you address who that was and what that, who that membership um, contained? Um, we had a couple of home building companies. We had uh, uh, home remodeling. Uh, I reached out initially to 
several of the uh, board members that sit on some of the planning department boards and ask them if they would be willing to participate. Um, one of the structural engineers that sits on a board actually referred a couple other structural engineers um, and one of the mechanical engineers referenced another mechanical engineer. Um, so people that have been in the industry for a while uh, with uh, particular attention to residential construction. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, Jerry was one of those that sat on the committee. Um, I do have a list that I think I shared with you and uh, Councilman Harding and, and uh, Paul's and maybe even you, Chris, when you joined the planning um, uh, board. Um, who the list of those people were. I don't have a list on me, but I could get you that list if you okay. would like to see that. Yeah, I remind who that was would be would be helpful. Okay. And I understand Mr. Stanifer was, I don't know if you were the chairman, but you were sort of maybe helping to convene the group, right? Yeah. Um, and then talk a little bit about the areas of, of dispute here. So there's a lot of things in there. I think there's consensus behind most of those things, but where there's not consensus is on a few items that were talked about today, the blower testing, requiring ducts for returns, and the energy rating index specifically. So you mentioned that a little bit when you had a chance to, re to rebuke the, the, uh, the opponents here. Can you talk a little bit about the committee, or, or Jerry, you can too, the committee's discussion on those particular items, why in the end they were not adopted unamend unamended as the state did? Well, I might bring in, um my chief mechanical inspector to help address some of these uh, with regards to, you know, standard of practice. We've been using the um, return air plenums in the interior walls for years, and uh, you know, it would it would require a little bit of a design change for the home builders, so that uh, they would have to then duct everything and and uh, uh, cut larger holes in the floor and everything. Tom. So um, I'll let Tom talk a little bit more about the specifics. Okay. Tom will need your name and address. Yes, sir. Uh, Thomas Phipps, Chief Mechanical Inspector, Planning Department, Permanent Inspection Division, 1819 Farnham. Uh, it would require the uh, major design sometimes of some buildings and structures of larger homes where you have to move a little bit more air. And like uh, Anna stated earlier, you would have to duct everything. And instead of having a cavity where basically someone has cut a hole in the wall, blocked a stud cavity, and basically, uh, and the air movement going there, you'd also, it would guarantee that you would seal the the duct work tighter if you did duct the return because every joint and seam in the duct work would have to be sealed. Therefore, increasing the air movement and capability of the blower going, uh, pulling back from the air to the air handler or from the furnace in the house. You would not lose it within the uh, uh, system or through the walls because many times that the stud cavities are not sealed when the drywall is actually attached. Depending on the home builder, some home builders are very conscious about it. Some of them, you know, they're waiting for our rough in to basically, when we give our rough in, then, they, then they'll just slap the drywall on okay. in situ situations like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I don't know that I need a lot of a lot of construction type details on these questions. I'm more, more interested in the question of um, were those items in fact considered and, were the, and what was the decision that expressly le left them unamended in your version? What, well, what was that decision point? One of, the, one of the things that we are trying to keep in mind is um, cost, the cost impact of some of these modifications or changes within this new building code. And so we're trying to balance between doing something that's reasonable that doesn't necessarily affect life safety. Um, it's not a structural issue, and um, and it could be something that uh, would be a cost savings overall if the homeowner weren't 
uh, required to duct every return in the house and some of these other uh, changes that they had. Um, so we were trying to weigh being reasonable with life safety issues, being reasonable with the cost impact, and this was one of the things that we felt as a committee was um, better left to the homeowners to choose to do something of that magnitude if they wanted to do that in their homes rather than requiring every homeowner to to make that choice okay or have no choice and jerry did you want to answer that question on behalf uh, of the committee too hold, hold on hold on hold on wait till you get to the mic and then you have Thank to say you. your name again i'll say it again jerry stanford 147 11 industrial road 68144 uh, we did it. We did in talking about the return errors, the ducting of the return errors in the state. Um, you know, keep in mind that those are that's only the return error. That's not a supply error. And those ducts right now currently are required to be sealed. We seal those with thermal pan underneath the drywall, and there's a mastic that seals those so that uh, doesn't uh, you know that doesn't leak there. As far as uh, I think Mr. Comar referred to, he found a leak in a, in a when he was testing it for a required duct testing right now in the city of Omaha and we continue to uh, any duct that's outside of the building envelope uh, has to have a test of lower test by uh, by a rater that's uh, and so that also was tightened up for those spaces outside of the uh, uh, so that we took all of that into consideration the blower door test uh, that test is good for the day it happens four years from now three years from now when that insulation settles when things change, when the caulking cracks, um, you know, it's a, it's a different story. That house may not pass at that time. And the last thing I might tell you is that even though um, we, we have these in the codes, these are the code minimums. There's, no, there's nothing, and most of us, many of us, go beyond in many areas as far as the, the code requirements. The codes have done a good job of bringing up the, uh, and emitting or deleting the uh, the leakage in these houses from the amount of ceiling we have to we're required to do now but that is the code minimum just like with many other things many builders go beyond that and, and when you come to buy a house you can certainly have that hers rating done many builders have a her provider hers rating for their house right now use it as a marketing tool others don't but uh, uh, that was kind of in the in the deal when we talked about the codes and we've always over the last 20 years tried to make a balance uh, so that we can still keep people um, in these houses okay uh, so it'd be accurate to say the committee considered these items but in the committee's judgment um, they didn't did not include them expressly because they didn't think it was a life safety issue and they were concerned about adding costs to home building i think it's fair okay sure. um and interestingly the the op opponents or the concerns being expressed uh, when it comes to cost, I uh, think that these contests could save the homeowner money by saving electric electrical costs and things like that once the homeowner is involved in the home or the property. So I guess there's two perspectives on that, too. Um, maybe I'll ask Mr. Holtzclaw if he could come up for a minute. What you're asking is price. Yeah. <laughs> David Holtzclaw, 5005 Chicago Street. Thank you for that, and thanks for bringing these concerns to our attention. I think just in the last week or so, we started getting emails on uh, on these items, um, and appreciate you here, being here today. Can you speak to the the issue of um, you know the decision point by the committee to uh, not include this because it wasn't a life safety issue, and, and they were concerned about affordable housing, and your perspective on that? Um, I, I'm I'm fully baffled by that decision. Um, first of all, um, this was introduced December 17th. Um, that's when it was introduced to you, to you. That's when it became public. I had been uh, emailing Anna since January 23rd of 2019 about this issue. Uh, I brought it to her attention when we brought it to the state legislature, uh, and the whole process started there. Um, and at no point in time was I aware of, did she bring us up? She told me that. I had to wait until it got presented to the city council. So it's presented on the 17th. Uh, I emailed her on the 22nd of December uh, um, 14 questions. Some of these questions you're asking, I, I sent to her. Um, many of them I have, I have not gotten answers with yet. So I, I don't know the committee's process. Um, it is interesting to me that she did not mention any HERS raiders. There was about a dozen in Omaha. 
Um, apparently none of them were on this committee. Uh, and I know that because I've asked all of them if they signed on this committee and they said no. Um, they could tell you what the cost of a door blur test. So having that perspective on this committee probably would have helped them process this information and what is much that, better. And what is that cost? I was going to ask that question. Uh, so that's probably about $150, $200, particularly if you're doing a uh, compliance test. We're just putting a door up, testing, getting a number, going to the next property. Uh, the numbers she, she references were extraordinarily high. Um, uh, it would be like the three to 400 range if you're doing door tests and you're taking an infrared camera and you're going around the house trying to find uh, leaks. So instead of doing a test for compliance, for code compliance, which takes half hour, you're spending three to four hours there calling through the attic, through the basement, trying to find spots. So, it's a, so that's a different uh, service. So for code, it'd be more of a compliant test, get a number, move to the next house. Okay. Uh, so it'd be about $150. So uh, she referenced, uh, I believe, $350,000, $300,000 for the cost of the current house. So that's roughly 0.05 percent of a new house. Uh, 37 states require this. Um, so home builders in 37 states have figured out how to make this cost effective. Iowa does it. Uh, so maybe our builders can talk to people in Council Bluffs. Okay. Got some helpful, helpful information to know what other states are doing. And I was going to save this question for later, but I'll ask it right now. So, so I, whenever you do something like this from a statewide perspective, because they are typically done at the, at the state level, I'm sure it's always in the interest of builders and others to have it be as consistent as possible across different municipalities and townships and what have you. Although I think it is, it does sometimes differ in other localities. <clears throat> are you aware of what the other communities surrounding Omaha do, do on this particular item? Um, a lot of them are going through that process now because it became state law in June of 2019. So um, uh, I've talked to two city council members in Bellevue. Uh, they said that they want to accept the entire unamended uh, versions of the IEC. Lincoln is also going down that direction right now. So imagine, if you will, uh, um, uh, the um, city uh, uh, leadership talks a lot about our brain drain and people not wanting to move here or live here. Um, imagine what would happen if you are a, a young person moving to Omaha and want to start a new family and you can get buy a house in Bellevue or Gretna that you know have this test done. You know it will hit the number because you have to hit it to get an occupancy permit or live in Omaha where you don't know where it's going to be. So I can buy a house where I know it's going to cost me $100 less per year, which covers the doorbell costs in a year and a half, or I may not. Or if you're like Valley, a smaller municipality that does nothing, and under state law, if you do nothing, then you're also under the state law, which requires you to do these tests, because that's the unamended version. So what does a new homeowner moving to Greater Omaha, where are they going to end up moving to live? Who's tax basement? Okay. And you know, <clears throat> do you have a, uh, I think a comment was made, they'd rather not mandate it, they'd rather make it elected uh, if someone wants to pursue this test. But in your mind, what you're saying is it may be an extra st step during the building process, but it's not a burdensome cost to what It's not a burdensome cost or time. <laughs> Uh, uh, numbers in the room do these over in Iowa, Des Moines uh, area, so we can uh, uh, very well work with the builders, be there on a certain day at a certain time to the test, and it's no schedule for the, issue for them. Okay. So it is not really a burden. For, I mean, it, I don't know why that'd be any more burden than a duct test or any more burden than a, a, a footer test, which you're doing now anyway. Okay. Thanks for now. Um, Let's see, Anna, maybe a couple more questions for you, and then I'll, I'll uh, yield the floor to other council members. Um, so if, I think it's chapter 11 we're speaking to that has the items in, in question here. Um, and so my question to you is, if, if we adopted chapter 11 unamended, so it does include the sustainability items that were just discussed, are there other implications, or is it truly just these two or three items? Um, it would just be these two or three items. Basically, everything that we've amended has just been two or three items. Okay. And Jerry, do you want to give me a perspective on the committee's thoughts on that? I mean, how, I mean, was this just something you thought wasn't necessary, or is this something our committee is, would be opposed to doing? Jerry Stanford, 147 Eleven Industrial Road. 
Um, no, I, I, it was a big deal with the committee. It isn't something we just jumped at and said, well, here's, here's a cost we can take out. I mean, this, is, this has been going on for a long time. There's a lot of thought was given to this, and not only in the committee, but in the building community. Uh, it's $125, it's $150, and you're right. That's not a big number. The, the big number is uh, it's another day of scheduling. It's another overhead number. It's another person, to, it's another subcontractor to contact. And, um, you know, it's just one more thing to put on that home buyer. And to, uh, again, like often we say, often people say, as I pointed out in my earlier testimony, uh, we'll recover this and we'll recover that and we're going to recover this. But in the end, it, it doesn't always work that way. There are also the same amount of tests out there that show it doesn't always work. And I'm, one thing we haven't talked about is about how tight these houses are now. And when we continue to tighten these houses, now we're to the point in many cases, and I think Mr. Phipps, so we talked about this in the committee, we talked about it um, on the mechanical review, that now we're to the point where often we have to put in additional equipment to bring in outside air, mechanical equipment to bring in outside air because we've tightened them up. And so to improve the air quality, we have to bring, uh, put that in. And, you know, I have, uh, numerous rental properties and we just have a hard time getting most of mine are single family it's real tough to get a home buyer or a, a, a rental a rental tenant to change the furnace filter we see the same thing in, in owned homes when we go back so a simple thing like changing uh, changing a furnace filter uh, is pretty minor comparing to maintaining that uh, their, their exchange equipment over time and over time when it quits then what do you have so we just uh, it may be only $150 for a blower door test, but then we move on to air quality, and uh, it, it kind of follows down the path. Okay. And I heard an analogy, just one second, I heard an, an analogy the other day, and I kind of I hadn't heard it before, but we probably are providing right now a Prius as far as energy savings in a house, and you're mandating by adopting the 2018 energy code un, uh, uh, unamended uh, that everybody uh, is moving on up up to a, um, um, sorry, a Volt. Tesla. Tesla. Yeah, a Tesla. We're not going to stop at a Lexus. We're going to go talk about I now. said Volt. Yeah. I'm Chevy okay. guy. Yeah, Volt. Yeah, <laughs> all right. So we're really, we're really, uh, we've come a long way. We've moved a long way. Um, okay. That's where we'd like to stay. Thank you. And then uh, shifting gears just a little bit, uh, Anna, um, so there was also a comment, not, to, not necessarily to these three um, specific items, but to the notion that the whole thing is a bit confusing and there could be some inaccuracies th through the complications of amending. Is that an accurate statement or thoughts on that, those remarks? Um, well, what I will say is that what we changed follows the standard ordinance format where if we want to get rid of it, we strike through it what we've added we've underlined and what is left unchanged has none of that um, those markings and so um, I can see how somebody who's not used to reading the ordinances could could see some confusion there um, what we are adopting today or proposing to adopt is um, the 2018 IRC with Chapter 11. And the Chapter 11 is the residential portion of the energy code. Um, when we get to uh, forming a committee to look at the building code for the commercial side of things, we will also look at the energy code for the commercial side um, as well during that time, during that process. So the strike-through versions could be a little confusing and awkward, but you're confident there aren't any inaccuracies in it? I have had many eyes on this helping me to proofread it and make sure that it reads the way that we want it to read. And then lastly, and maybe on a more positive note, uh, because it's been overshadowed with the, the atoms of concern here, I think an, an important and interesting addition people care about is the addition or the appendix about tiny homes. Can you talk a little bit about what it will do in that respect? Well, what the tiny homes appendix chapter does is we've had a lot of interest from the community with regards to tiny homes. It seems to be trending right now. Um, 
they've always been allowed in some respect. Um, what this particular chapter does is it defines that tiny homes are less than 400 square feet. And if you build a tiny home um, with in the parameters of this particular chapter, there are some uh, changes or benefits you get to some of the geometries, uh, which means, for instance, uh, with regards to stairs, a lot of times, you know, you've got the seven and three quarter rise and the uh, 10 inch tread or 11 inch tread. And um, what the tiny home chapter allows you to do, because you are building so small, you can change that rise to a certain geometry so it can exceed that seven and three quarters so that instead of your stair coming out you know here it only comes out here and you have more livable space within that tiny home and so there's some other things built into the chapter um, some of the people that were sitting on the committee frankly surprised me that they really were adamant about adopting this particular chapter because they've seen um, a need for these smaller houses, even though their main their main business may be building million and two million dollar homes, they see a need to um, address the affordable housing issue. And one of the ways that um, that they wanted to do it was by adopting the tiny home chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a positive addition in that respect. When we do talk about affordable housing, this code wouldn't address where they can go, which is which is a different matter. But right. it, it does address. Right. Um, how they can be constructed, right? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Thank you. I'll yield, yield the floor for now. Thank you, Vice President Palermo. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I just had a couple questions. I believe the gentleman's name was Mark. Stadola. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. The other Mark. Oh. Yeah, I might have some questions for you, too. Yes. And the yellow shirt. A couple of Marks. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name. Mark Waskatoff, 6323 North 115th Circle. Would you mind spelling your last name so our clerk can get it down? L-O-S-C-U-T-O-F-F. -F. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for coming down, sir. Appreciate it. The reason I asked you to come down is you said you just got off of work. Mm. So um, I just have some simple questions. I know a lot of the focus is on uh, a few different items here, but there's, well, there's one thing I'm trying to put together. I can assume what it is, but... Uh, if I called you, could you could you do a blower door test? Is that what you do? Yes, I do blower door testing, um, energy audits on existing homes. Okay. Um, and duct testing. Okay. So let's go back to the blower door test. I've I've called you as either a homeowner, home builder, whatever. Tell me, I guess in in a short amount of time, what exactly is the blower door test? Basically, um, we take an external exterior doorway and we set up a piece of equipment there that has a big fan that has sensors and a controller attached to that. And air is blown out of the house with all the windows and doors shut tight. Um, and uh, the equipment measures the rate at which the air is blown out of the house. The theory is that that equals the amount of air that leaks in from every source. Okay. And uh, roughly how long does the test take? About an hour. About an hour, okay. And, and what would you charge to, to do this test? My standard base rate is $185. Okay. Uh, that was all I had, just to kind of put it together as far as what exactly and how the, the test was performed. So thank you, sir. Council Member Harding, you are recognized. Uh, thank you. I'm getting in over my skis by asking these questions, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Because I'm, I'm going to pick up a little bit on this blower test, too, because I think what, um, what Mr. Standerford said, too, um, I didn't think about before, but makes perfect sense that you might do this test today. And... It, it may it may have a completely different result um, in in time after that just because of cracking of, of um, caulking and, and uh, settling and, and other factors that may come into that so you know I, I, I heard um, uh, mr. I'll, I'll say mark I apologize I would put your last name but 
um, saying that, uh, and, and to Mr. Standerford's point, I understand the test may take an hour, but you have the setup and things like that and the scheduling. And But it, it, it's also interesting to me that it, it, you set it up on, on one door, if I understood you right, and, and you test it, you could get a completely different result, I would think, if you were setting it up in a, in a different area or a different door. And once that result is in, uh, then what what happens? What's what's the next step? Um, if if I'm paying $185 uh, for that test and it, it fails or it's not to the standard that I as a homeowner might want, then I'm into the the next step and and the next step into getting the as um, as I think Tom Phipps was pointing out. Then we have or someone pointed out uh, having infrared. Um, detection on, on certain points to maybe identify where that is. I, I, I started thinking about it, it this, this seems to me to be more akin to maybe like a Carfax report. And maybe then, you know, it's, it's whether or not it, it passes the test. And, and me as a, as a home buyer, you know, that, that might be my decision whether or not I want to go forward with that and as to what level I might want to take that to. So if I, uh, if, if I want to have that Cadillac test to, to figure out where all those points of, uh, of weakness, if you will, are, then that, that should be my decision, I, I would think. Um, and, and therefore, uh, I, under, I understand the, the, the interest of those uh, of saying that it's, it's a warranted test, but I also understand uh, that maybe that should be left up to the consumer whether or not they want to have that test done. And then lastly, I'll point out, it, it, it's interesting when, again, Mr. Sanderford was talking about, we make, sometimes we make these, um, these environments so airtight uh, that the air quality can be diminished unless you bring in additional uh, fresh air or additional air uh, so that because that house can't breathe, then then you have those implications and, and those considerations to to weigh in on as well. So um, I understand the concerns of, 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 of those who would like to see this uh, remain in, um, at least at this point. I've, I'm comfortable with it being amended out. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Uh, Mr. Stadola, did you wish to have a few words? Mark Stadola, 19211 Grand Avenue Circle. Uh, I've served on the MOBA board. Actually, I had two years as president, uh, so I'm representing MOBA along with Jerry. Uh, I also own Charleston Homes, a home building company here in Omaha. I was not planning on testifying, but I did hear a few things that I wanted to come up here and address. Um, first of all, I heard earlier, um, you know, why are we changing something that a bunch of national experts um, put together? Uh, I have been involved in home building for over 30 years. Would not consider myself an expert, but I feel like I do know quite a bit about home building. Um, this committee was put together by Anna, um, and you had, uh, you know, Jay Davis was heavily involved. Uh, you know, Chief Building Inspector Mike is back there. Uh, home builders, um, mechanical chiefs. Um, but the one thing that wasn't addressed was we had other um, building officials from different jurisdictions. And the one thing as home builders we'd really like to do is have the same codes in every jurisdiction. I build in Bellevue, Papillion, La Vista, Sarpy County, Gretna, Douglas County. And this is one thing with these amendments that every other jurisdiction and these building officials are on board with. They understand the need for everybody to kind of play by the same amount of rules. Um, so I just want to address that. Uh, in this committee, Anna, um, Anna started it in March of 2019. Uh, Working with Jay Davis, Jerry and I, we go back many, many years and thousands of hours. I don't know if you guys have seen the IRC book, but it's about that thick. And we went page by page. Uh, so this wasn't something that, you know, was stated earlier that we just kind of put together here in the last couple months. Um, it's been a long time going, going through this. Uh, the second thing I heard up here was the blower door test, and I think you're getting a pretty good understanding of what that is. It was stated here earlier that um, by not having a blower door test, uh, the homeowner is giving up an average of $91 savings. 
that is not true. This is a test. Um, about five years ago, I had nine of our models tested because I want to see where we're at. Back then, I can't comment on how much it costs right now, but it sounds like about $185, consistent 150 to 200. Back then, it was about 300 to 500 dollars. Every single one of my nine homes passed. I made a decision. Why would I spend the money? Because that's going to get passed on to the home buyer. So just because it's a test, if you do it, doesn't mean that there's a savings. That's if it fails, and then if it fails, you do have to spend that extra money to go find out where the leak is at. So it's not $185. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Gray, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to give the gentleman here an opportunity to, because there was a comment made about if you do the blower, if you do the blower door test at a different door or a different area, you might come up with a different number. I just wanted you to respond to that. Name and address again. Mark Loskatov, 6323 North 115th Circle. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter which doorway you put it on, whether it's the front door or the back door. Um, the, um, the, the test is computerized, um, and uh, it, there's a standard test pressure that it reduces uh, the house to. And that's the pressure at which uh, the air exits through the fan. So that is taken into consideration in how the test works. I just it's saw him raise his hand, so I wanted okay. to give him an opportunity to respond. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. President. Um, I was going to ask Ms. Best Boy Asney a couple questions. Um, first question was there was a comment by, I think it was Mr. Stadola, maybe, maybe it was someone else maybe Mr. Stanford, as to what happens in jurisdictions other than Omaha that have not adopted amendments um, and jurisdictions around Omaha who have. So do you know what the lay of the land is in Bellevue, La Vista, Papillion? I'm not sure the extent of their amendments. Um, I do know they're all on more current versions of the residential code than what we are presently. I don't believe any of them is at the 2018 edition, which is what we're looking to go to. Um, I have had conversations with um, Lincoln, and they were presently in the committee stage going through the residential code also but i haven't i haven't touched base with them here recently to find out how far into that process they are so if you haven't adopted amendments like it was represented valley has not mm -hmm. and they're subject to the nebraska right statutory based yes. code mm -hmm. which doesn't have the um, amendments out it has the required testing in right Okay. And then if the amendments pass, this, does the strike through language keep the current 2000 and was it six edition? No. What does it bring it up to? Or Here's just where it get, this is where it gets a little complicated with the energy code and the, and the residential code. The energy code, the International Energy Conservation Code has what I will call two parts. That's it has the IECC. The IECC. It has a commercial part and it has a residential part. That residential part is Chapter 11 of the International Residential Code. Okay. And that is what we are looking or proposing to adopt when we adopt the 2018 Residential Code. So okay. we get the energy portion in there, we just haven't we haven't modified the IECC. Okay. That's as clear as I can. <laughs> so if I hear translating what your contention is in terms of your recommendation is you're, you're improving energy efficiency with what you are adopting. You're just not taking it as far as some people would like in this step. We are improving energy efficiency from, we, from what we are enforcing presently. Is there a way for you to quantify that or to explain that improvement so um, 
the public has a, a greater appreciation for how we're improving it. I'm trying to think of how I can put it in terms that <laughs> um, it's it's basically allowing them to I don't know if I can put it into into terms. I mean, it, it's I I go back to my analogy where we've gotten these houses so tight and so comfortable and so energy efficient. Um, I I look at it as being. Like Jerry said, it's that Prius model. It's good. It runs well. Do you need to spend the extra money for the Tesla? I mean, it's it's energy efficient. It's um, I'm trying to think. Tom, can you think of any uh, or Mike? So putting it into terms trying to well I'm putting you on the spot but it's just that there's there's the contention that the dichotomy in between the proponents and the opponents is that it would lead some to possibly can take away from this that what you're proposing in terms of bringing the code up to 2018 versus what's not getting up to the 2018 edition somehow means that our community does not have energy efficiency codes in terms of the residential building. I would so that's what I'm trying that. to get you to tell us, educate us about. I would disagree with that. I mean, most of these home builders are probably exceeding the minimum standards of the code. And the way that the codes are supposed to be written is as a minimum standard. So you know, you've got your wheels, you've got your chassis, you've got your, you know, uh, body, you've got air conditioning, you've got heating, you've got every, all the comforts of a home. You just haven't put those bells and whistles to get the automatic driving or automatic parking. So it is energy efficient. It's come a long way since 2000. Um, where we just had, you know, a little bit of extra insulation in the walls in the attic, but you're not taking it to that next step where it's just all the bells and whistles. That's my interpretation. Okay. And you're an architect by training? Yes, I am. Okay. And licensed? Yes, I am. All right. Thank you, um, Ms. Best Boyazny. Uh, Council Member Pauls. When will you revisit these, uh, the topics that we're talking about today? Will you revisit this? We will. What's before you now is the residential code. Right. What we're going to be visiting this forthcoming year would be the commercial building code. Um, if we get this measure adopted as it's written, um, we probably would not revisit it for, I would say, another three years. Um, the way that the ICC, the International Code Council, operates is that they, they basically have a new version coming out every three years. And um, residentially, we haven't kept up with that every three years. Okay. So this, this is a big jump for us to go from 2006 to 2018. Um, but going forward, I would like to think that we would stay more current with newer versions. Okay. Uh, then let me ask you, uh, the group of individuals who help you with this, you know, you had builders, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you know any of the opponents out here? No, I do not. I'm wondering the next time uh, that you reach out to one or two of them to get them on, the, on your group just to hear what they have to say. That's what I see. It, it bring, a, bring a person in, and uh, then it, they may agree or disagree with you. After a while, they'll just say, hey. Oh, I have no, I have no problems having people. We, the, the committee that we had, we had very robust conversations. Okay. And yeah. we had, I would say that of the amendments that we're proposing today, 
there was not anything in here that was 100% unanimous. I'm just uh, saying extend a hand maybe. No, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. My my response to that would be that we did have mechanical engineers involved okay. with the process. So they understand the energy portions of okay. the code. They understand the mechanical portions of the code and the things that were affected by the amendments that we're proposing okay. today. Well, then I'm hoping those uh, mechanical engineers who did come in front of us or whatever their background is, that they would know some of the people on the committee, which you say. I would suspect that they do. I know Tom has, has um, yeah. talked and, with some of them. And I'm sure there's some respect within They say, well, okay, now I get it. You know, Because yeah. I have to be honest with you, several years ago I had my house um, recited. I had it wrapped and then recited. It came so it didn't breathe. So I had to go in then and add things to the roof. Just give the circulation. I did. They did such a good job, and I, he said, "I said, well, what's wrong?" He said, "Your house isn't breathing," and I a little, a little did I realize that. He said, "Well, when you wrap a house and you put siding on, you know," I said, "It looked pretty because it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. had a nice green wrap around the thing." So I get that part of it, but I, I just think if, if some of these individuals, if they know who you were talking with, it, it may alleviate some of the, the concerns. And I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Palermo. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Stadola, I got one question for you, if I could. Not to keep picking on you by any means. You have to identify yourself yeah. again. Mark Stadola. So you had mentioned um, in your business that you had uh, built some houses previously and you, you did this test and they all passed. So I'm not asking you as a, a business owner to comment on other home builders, but as a member of this committee, um, is it safe to say that you looked at all home builders across the city, uh, regardless of uh, the lower end or the higher end, and did the committee assume that they would all pass this test? Uh, the, the majority of the home builders in Omaha, um, at some point in time, were all involved in these conversations. And, and I'll tell you that I think uh, the city of Omaha, and I think your building official tested this, has a really, really good group of home builders and some of the things that you're talking about as far as you wrap in the house that's how we do things on every house now so I'm not sure if I answered your question or not well I just want to make sure I mean as you made the statement of you know your company had no problem passing this test right we want to make sure that other home builders who maybe uh, don't have the standards and maybe the equipment or technology or uh, the materials they use are up to that par and we wouldn't want to just generalize that, well, right. this test is okay for this company, but not for this across the city. Right. Um, that's a difficult question to answer because you're asking and I know me to, I speak put you on for, the spot, to speak for so other companies. But I can say, I don't as want you a to whole, speak. these other companies were involved in these conversations, and I do believe that we are all building, you know, much more energy efficient houses sure. than we were 10 years ago, five years ago. Uh, and again, you know, these standards have really changed uh, over the years. And I agree when you asked the question earlier about, you know, what percentage of change, you know, that's a really hard question to answer as far as what percent, but they've definitely gotten a lot better. Um, but to answer your question, for, for the majority, yes, we're all building the same, the same home. Okay. Building codes re require us to. Thank you for answering yeah. that. And as I understood Ms. Best Boyazny's testimony, correct me if I'm wrong, she's saying, I think, not to put words in your mouth, the industry in new home residential construction has come so far in what they've upgraded their energy efficiency that how do you quantify this next step that the opponents who don't want this chapter... I would managed. say that's that's pretty accurate. So... I mean, um, I, would, I would add, you know, you take it so far, how much, how much further... There's only so much energy efficiency that that right. we're going to be able to achieve, I think, with the unless it would there's appear some to me new technology that it would be in the home builders' interests with customers to have some sort of rating that you all agree on in terms of, you know, we hear about lead gold and platinum and or whatever silver, and so that if the consumer really wanted to know how how efficient energy wise the house is they'd know the specs that this person 
yeah. like Mr. Standerford's company is building to, or like Mr. Stadola, you know, we build at the gold level yeah. uh, in our practices. And m many of them do. Many of them have Energy Star rated houses, and they go over and above what those minimum standards are for the um, for the inter for the codes. Right. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further lights. Thank everyone for their uh, their testimony, pro and con, and for the information answering our questions. Next item. Item 58, an ordinance to approve an agreement with the Nebraska State Probation District 4J in the amount of $5,834 and to authorize funding for such agreement from the City of Omaha's fiscal year 2018 Project Safe Neighborhoods Grant Award. The public hearing on item 58 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Item 59, an ordinance to approve the fiscal year 2019 Highway Safety Programs Grant Award in the amount of $116,593 during the project period of October 1, 2019 to September 30, 2020. The public hearing on item 59 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Item 60, an ordinance to approve the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Fiscal Year 2019 Community Development Block Grant in the amount of $4,596,670, the Fiscal Year 2019 Home Investment Partnership Grant in the amount of $2,127,463, and the Fiscal Year 2019 Emergency Solutions Grant in the amount of $404,838. The public hearing on Item 60 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Bill Lukash, Omaha Planning Department, here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Yep. And you went through all the public hearings, advertising. Yep. Thank you. Uh, are there any opponents? Thank you. I can't believe this year we don't have anyone testifying, just the planning department. Okay. Public hearings closed. Item 61, an ordinance to acquire vacant and improved property at 1502 California, located within the Builders District at No Doe Redevelopment Plan Area. The public hearing on item 61 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Council, Kevin Anderson, Deputy Chief of Staff, City of Omaha Mayor's Office, um, here to introduce this ordinance, which authorizes the acquisition of 1502 California, consistent with the redevelopment plan approved by this body uh, for the Builders District at Nodo. Uh, the developer is here to present the pro project and detail uh, the efforts for acquisition to date. Uh, that being said, there was a request put forth to uh, continue the public hearing based off of the developer's schedule. Um, they are here and present and available to uh, discuss today. They wanted to uh, request the continuance based off of the, the thought that they wouldn't be available yet today, but since they're here, uh, they wanted to be able to uh, be able to respond to any questions on the record and that sort of thing. So, so they're withdrawing the request to continue the That's public. correct, and, and, and that, that's at the council's discretion. So. Thank Thank you. I'll make myself available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? President Jerem, <clears throat> members of the council, city staff, good afternoon. Happy New Year. Um, I am Jay Noddle with Noddle Companies, 2285 <clears throat> South 67th Street in Exarban Village. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to go back a little bit. In uh, early 2017, we began to vision um, what is becoming the Builders District. And um, in mid-2018, um, the first publicity about the project hit the streets. Um, by <clears throat> October 30th of 2018, the council approved the redevelopment plan for the area, um, and I believe on December 11th of 2018, the council approved the redevelopment agreement, and that agreement uh, encourages the development of the entire area. It also states that in the event properties are not able to be acquired privately, the city um, will use their powers of eminent domain to assist. Since that happened, uh, a large number of properties, a great deal of, of ownerships have been acquired. Um, and we have also been working with uh, Bruce Kaiman, who is the owner of Sauls, um, which owns the five properties in the immediate area. Uh, the subject of today's um, hearing is 
just one of those five properties. And Mr. Nottle, you said the, the, a great number of properties have been acquired. That's through private negotiated That's correct. All Thank of you. them have been acquired through Thank private you. negotiations. Um, Mr. Kaiman um, operates a business here in Omaha, but um, he makes residence in Colorado, so I have been to see him on two occasions, um, and I have met with him in Omaha on a couple of occasions as well, toured his properties, um, spent time touring um, a broader area, um, thinking about potential relocation sites for him. He had um, a couple of ideas. One was to put everything together in one location, um, much larger than um, the, the sum total of what he's got today. Uh, and some other discussions involved what, what happens if you relocate things a little bit separately from one another. He asked us to pursue three different properties, um, all of which we pursued and unfortunately ran into a dead end in all three occasions. And it wasn't related to math at all. It was related to the current property owner's desire to sell those properties. Um, or um, in one case, um, the city's feeling along with ourselves that um, his use um, in a certain location um, probably wouldn't be appropriate, would be very objectionable to the neighboring property owners. And, and if you think today's been a long meeting, I think the, um, the public hearing at the planning board and the city council to rework zoning um, for one of those properties um, would have been very, very lengthy and, and probably would not have been achievable. In any case, um, Mr. Kyman's been um, not terribly accessible um, but highly professional and very cordial in my conversations with him. Um, the last conversation I had with him was um, shortly after Labor Day. That was my second trip out to see him after a series of other co phone calls and meetings. Um, he indicated he would um, come to Omaha, um, as he does periodically, and um, sort of take it upon himself to look for locations to relocate to and get back to me. Um, since then, we've reached out to him a few times and have had um, no response. And so we're at a point with the Builders District where other parts of the district are getting ready to go. As many of you know, or hopefully all of you know, the Keywood Headquarters building is topped out um, and, and well on track and on schedule to be completed on time in the early part of 2021. Um, and so now it's time to get a couple of the other building projects going. Um, and um, we're, we're not able to make progress, although we've had nice conversations. Um, so this is a, a request of the city to pass an ordinance of necessity. We would like to continue. Um, we, we'd like to do this privately, and I'm hopeful that with this, um, the passage of this ordinance, um, we'll be at a point where um, Mr. Kaiman can make the time for us and, and really focus on this and, and we can get this done. Again, I want to stress, um, we, there, he has five properties. We have made him an offer for all five properties. Um, we're only talking about one property today. Um, and that's the one that's really essential to keep the next um, portions of the project and the district moving. Thank I'll be you. happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Noddle. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. One public hearing can be held for item 62 and 63. Item 62, an ordinance to approve the designation of an enhanced employment area for the Village Point Anant Development Area located at 215 and 303 South 181st Street and 18120 Harney Streets. Item 63, an ordinance to approve a development agreement for occupation tax and enhanced employment area with Village Point Lodging, LLC, and a not partners, LLC, authorizing use of up to $3,600,000. The public hearing on items 62 and 63 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the City Council, Kevin Anderson, City of Omaha Mayor's Office, Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, here representing the Enhanced Employment Area Occupation, Occupation Tax Committee, uh, which recommended approval of the EEA occupation tax for these, uh, this particular project. Uh, the applicant is here and will detail the project and application of the tax, and I'll make myself available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents?
Good afternoon, Mr. President, Councilmen, and Councilwomen. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year. Uh, we are here to name and address. Deepa Gangahar, 1350 North 143 Avenue Circle. Thank you. Omaha. So we have this a project in West Omaha, 8.8 acres of land that we plan to develop in multiple phases, and it's not a TIF project. And the uh, first phase is already in progress, and the anchor for the first phase is uh, upper end, millennial friendly, uh, technology dependent, Marriott uh, uh, Aloft brand hotel. Along with that, we plan to build a restaurant, which will be about eight to 10,000 square feet space, and a banquet hall. And on the fifth floor, we plan to have uh, condominiums, luxury condominiums, or market rate apartments, based upon what the market bears. And uh, phase two is a preliminary stage, but right now we're talking about phase one, which is about $24 million project, and we are applying for uh, employment enhancement tax of 3.6 million. Thank you. Are there any other proponents that wish to be heard? Thank you. You can stay close by in case there are Thank questions. You. Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Councilmember Pauls, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Could I? Do you have a, uh, a map or a diagram of the of the project? Uh, we do have a map. No, I don't have a diagram. Oh, okay. But this is uh, uh, between 180th and 181st Street. Okay. Between Harney and Burke. Okay. Uh, I I looked at what I have here, on, and I'm I'm having a hard time really making out what it's going to end up looking like. Uh, the pictures that I have on the attachment, you have that. Copied uh, by? Not on hand. I apologize. Kevin, we're, we're getting you one okay. from. It's on the agenda. Yeah. They're just going to yeah. pull it up. It's like this is what I'm talking about. Correct. I would just like to see what, what it's going to look like because it's hard for me to tell on this. So. Yeah, yeah. I think those are show the digital screen. No, we've got a bigger one. Yeah, so. <laughs> I guess you're right. It was a technology-driven project. Here we are. <laughs> Kurt Trevetti, uh, 222 South 15th Street, Suite 401N, Omaha. Um, Dr. Gengahar's uh, business okay. partner as well. Uh, well, I'm going to just by, sort of uh, walk me through it. What is this going to be? The So it's a five-story building. Phase one is consists of a five-story building. The Aloft brand they're considered called baby W's. You guys are familiar with the W's that are in tier one markets. The Aloft brand kind of takes that and allows it to be more tier two market friendly. The fifth floor uh, is currently um, slated for um, high end luxury condos. The bottom four floors will be a combination of the hotel rooms. Uh, the entire first floor is a public space, approximately eight to 9,000 square foot, two, floor, uh, two story restaurant with outdoor patio and approximately 4,000 square feet of banquet space. And then obviously, the west side of this phase one development is all the parking uh, to supplement that as well. There will be a small parking garage for the luxury condo owners as well. This is the elevation that you will see when you're driving south on 180th Street off of Dodge. Uh, as you're passing by, this is exactly what you will see, the exact colors and, and lighting as well. Is it by the bank? Is that? It is right next door to the bank. Okay. Okay. What uh, bank? Okay. Mike Patesel Bank. Sure. Uh, okay. So what I'm seeing right now, this is what the project will look like. I, I mean, I know there may be some changes, no, but, but. No. This is exactly what it will look like. We have not deviated from this elevation. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say, this is it. What I. That is correct. Okay. And then plus a parking lot. That is correct. Okay. Um, now, Ms. Jansen, I'd like phase to... Phase one, right? Phase one. Correct. And there are how many phases? Two phases. Okay. What's the second phase? What do you anticipate? The second phase is another hospitality and retail project. 
obviously after this one ramps up. Okay, on that same lot? Yes, there's a, uh, approximately four, there, there's this, this phase one is being done on 2.7 acres of land. Okay. Just south of that, adjacent to this, there's 3.4 okay. acres of land. Okay. And let the record reflect that's Dr. Gangahar talking. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, I appreciate that, Mr. Anderson. Uh, now, what kind of uh, incentive is there, t tax incentive, are, are we going after for this project? Uh, the Enhanced Employment Occupation Tax applies 3% uh, tax to uh, lodging, banquet sales, food and beverage, and parking, 3% each. Okay, so let's say now, let's say we're going to have a restaurant there, and I ordered a, a $100 meal. What would that cost me in a, a, another restaurant? How, many, how much tax, I mean, what would be my tax, 7%? Yeah, you, uh, all, all the other taxes included sales tax would be the 7%. Um, then with this development, plus the 3% or $3 in enhanced okay. employment area occupation tax. Okay, and I'm doing this basically right now. Yep. For the the 7% seven, seven uh, of the dollars would go to government. Correct. The other $3 goes to who? Uh, it goes towards paying off the debt service associated with eligible costs back to the project. Okay. As I've read on other projects, I saw an end game on years, like uh, the one on uh, that we just uh, took a look at a little earlier today, like it was going to run to the year 2037. I couldn't find an end date on this one. Yeah, state statute mandates that uh, uh, projects within a CRA or uh, in a, within a blighted area have a 20-year cap to when that tax can be applied. There is no such cap on projects outside of a, um, a blighted area. So there's a 20 year on this one, is that what I'm No, not on this one because it's not within a CRA or blighted area. So it's for how long? And, and, until the, the debt until service the three, is paid uh, off. Uh, whatever is paid yeah. off. Uh, and then of course that goes to the developer. Uh, what's, how can I get the, the, this particular tax? What do I have to do to get it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an application to the city of Omaha uh, of which is reviewed by the EEA committee, uh, taking a look at the merits of the project uh, in accordance with uh, enabling legislation, and then it comes to city council based off of that recommendation. But I have to hire so many people. Dude. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, outside of a, a CRA, I might have city law help me on this. Uh, outside of a CRA, there's a minimum threshold for employment, for investment into the project. I don't want to give you incorrect numbers at this point. Uh, I mean, in the past, I've, I've, I heard a number, 30. Yeah, depending on the size of the project, up to 30 full-time employees. Okay, which you could do it in a, in a yeah, like yep. this. Okay, so, and I understand, I'm not against uh, this particular project, but what I'm trying to figure out, let's say, can I do this, use the same incentive, but let's say that I want to duplicate what the good doctor is doing here, let's say I wanted to do it on a, a plot of land on a 180th in Q. I could do the same, go for the, the same uh, tax base. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so long as you're meeting the eligible expenses under the community development law, yes. So this, so uh, throughout, what I'm trying to say then, developers ought to be, ought to be using this. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, is, it is one of a, of a small handful of tools we have to incentivize development. That's right. correct. Okay, so let's say a hotel that was built right down on Saddle Creek, uh, they could have used this also if they so chose. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Uh, you know, it, it, it's project specific. Uh, for some projects, it, it pencils out really well. For others, it doesn't. Uh, you got to make a determination on your margins of whether the markets can support that additional tax. Okay. Uh, and to me, logic, uh, I, and I don't know because I'm not in that business, but. This seems like this ought to be something that I'm, I would use throughout the city. It's, it's fair to say the vast majority of the projects that have been awarded uh, EEA occupation, occupation tax have been lodging. Yeah, because when this first started, I said we're going to have a bunch of islands, and this is another island. But I could have this, if I, no matter where I could find in the city, if I had the available land and I will have at least 30 or whatever the amount is of individuals working, I could 
apply for this yeah and when we take a look as a committee at the merits of a project i think the application of a tax on what can be perceived to be out of town residents coming in based off of lodging uh, I, I think it's it's much more palatable yeah well right i could see that i mean it makes sense but okay so if I, i'm just trying to say if i'm a developer i would be naive not to at least use this for my project if i would qualify it can be a great tool yes i'm surprised more people haven't used it correct okay okay thank you i appreciate uh showing your uh, your vision out there at that part of the city thank you thank you mr anderson uh before i call on dr gangahar and then Ms. Uh, council member festerson is there an amortization schedule for the uh, enhanced employment tax repayment or a minimum annual payment yeah we base that off of Uh, based off of 20 years, uh, but again, because it's outside of a CRA, we are enable we are allowed to kind of cash flow that a little bit. But the amortization was based off of 20 years. Thank you, Dr. Gangahar. Did you wish to be recognized for a minute before I call on Council Member? Yes, sir. Deepak Gangahar, Omaha. Sir, the bottom line is market determines what the customer will buy. If you keep on putting taxes, your room rate goes high. They're not going to come to you. Eventually, market determines what what price you can charge. And second thing is, if I remember the statute, it says you have to invest uh, five million minimum and create 30 plus jobs. And we are creating 100 jobs once our phase one is finished between the hotel, restaurant, banker hall, and the, and the condominiums. Thank you. Sounds like you've studied the statute like the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Council Member Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Anderson, just a question for you. Um, one of the things the council has expressed an interest in in the past when we have these um, financing propositions coming to us under the enhanced employment tax is the committee's analysis of it. And specifically, did the committee determine this would not be possible without this, this tool? Uh, that's not a requirement of, of enabling legislation. Um, it's not a requirement, but we're interested in that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and um, I don't know that I can give you a, a determination on that. Um, I, I'm sure the developer can, uh, but at, at but the, four. yeah, yeah. A, a but for, but he's wishing for you to call him up. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That'd be fine if he wants. Okay. So, uh, name again, Deepak Gangahar, Omaha, Nebraska, everything's possible. Question is what kind of margin you have if without this EE tax, the margin is 3%. And 3% is on the edge, perhaps will not uh, in, in, you know, excite us to build this project. With, with this taxation, it comes to close to 6%, where uh, we can tolerate uh, in a few percentage points up and down. But at 3%, uh, it's too risky to take this kind of project worth $24 million. Okay, thank you. That's the ROI, yes. return on investment. Yes, okay. ROI. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is that all, Mr. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Harding, is this your district? It is, but first I need to apologize to Mr. Festerson. I, I didn't mean <laughs> to step over your, your comments. I apologize for that. Um, it, it is in my district, and um, I, I, I just wanted to reiterate what's, what's been said as well. It's, I mean, the, the decision is upon the developer. It's, um, it is market-driven. If, if, um, if, if it prices them out of, uh, out of getting people to come to that property for that purpose, they're going to have to adjust their prices. Um, the tax may still be there, but their prices are going to have to be adjusted otherwise. So it is, born, it is a um, expense or risk borne by the developer. Uh, this is an, an area that is not eligible for tax inc increment financing, as Mr. Anderson stated. This is... Um, you know, it's because of that we cannot use TIF here. We have limited amount of tools uh, for uh, for developers, 
and uh, I think this is an appropriate application of the EEA for that area of town and for this project. Thank you. Council Member Palermo. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Anderson. I, I just wanted to continue with uh, Council Member Paul's comment about, because I'm sure if somebody was sitting at home and they are keeping track with their pencil and paper and they heard him say, well, any developer come apply for this. Um, just give us a little refresher since it's the beginning of the new year. Um, so outside of the blighted or CRA, um, this EEA obviously would have to go to a committee for approval, not just if you're out of the area, you automatically qualify for it, correct? Correct. And then who's on this committee that makes these decisions? Uh, department heads, including uh, city law, uh, public works, finance, planning, and a representative of the mayor's office, which is myself. Okay, thank you. So if you're listening at home, there's a little more to it than just applying. Thank you. Absolutely. And is the mayor in support of this? Yes. Thank you. Uh, no further lights? Non-action items, items 64 through 89, do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on an agenda for consideration. Roll call. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Meeting is adjourned at 421. How many projects have been shut down by the way? I don't know. That would be a nice... That's a request. How many projects...